it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker who doesn't need any introduction to this group. Um, he's a co-conspirator with me to organize this summer colloquium. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you, Judith, to organize this. Judith is a scientist at NCAR with a joint appointment between the weather and climate division at truly an, a bridge, a S2S bridge at NCAR. She had both worked in academia before and at an operational center, uh, ECMWF. Her interests lie in diagnosing and representing both systematic and random model errors. She has worked across the scales from developing stochastic microphysics schemes to studying the response to an external forcing in the presence of subgrid scale variability. She's the co-chair of the working group on probability, dynamics, and ensemble forecasting, PDEF, under the World Weather Research Program. She's most known for her work in developing stochastic parameterization schemes and most proud of truly understanding the concept of noise-induced drift in complex earth system prediction um, systems. Thanks, Judith. And Judith will talk about S2S prediction and uncertainty. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I have to, uh, to uh, give this back to you. Anytime you want a summer school organized, uh, I will do this if Anisha is part of the team. I will share my screen. Okay. Um, so um, uh, I will talk about S2S predictability and uncertainty and rather sort of giving a history of the field, I thought since I have sort of the last um, lecture slot of the week, I'm going to review a little bit what we heard this week and I give you sort of my perspective on what's being discussed. So <clears throat> this is sort of this uh, schematic about um, forecast skill as function of lead time. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we've heard about uh, predictability from initial conditions, teleconnection patterns. And what I wanted to point out is that um, sort of, uh, uh, and um, uh, Sergei made this point, uh, sort of that, that uh, y-axis is not well-defined. It says excellent, and here it says fair, and here it says poor, um, but this is not a quantitative measure of skill. Uh, I think it is sort of weighted by what you're interested in. <laughs> and so what you're interested in on sub-seasonal uh, uh, timescales is maybe poor and on seasonal fair. Um, and so I wanted to talk a bit more about the quantification of this. So I thought I first share some thoughts on model error, some thoughts on predictability, and then some thoughts on the physical sources of predictability. And Anish, I would ask you, give me a strict five minute warning, please. Okay. Think of it. <laughs> so um, on short time scales, um, and I'm thinking here in numerical weather prediction system, where the skill comes from the initialization, um, uh, the system is mostly dominated by random model errors. And so when we run then um, ensemble prediction systems, we, uh, we know that there is um, sensitivity to the initial conditions. And so we don't run a single one, but we need to have an ensemble. This is the talk that Joe gave. And what we really want to do in numerical weather prediction is we want that the spread that is the variance between the different ensemble members at any given forecast lead time is the same as the RMS error of the ensemble mean. And this way we can use the spread as the uncertainty forecast of the ensemble mean. So if the ensemble mean error is really large and the spread is very large, then we can look at the spread and say, okay, this is a very unpredictable forecast, but our ensemble said it would be unpredictable. Whereas if the spread is really small, we would expect that the error is small. Uh, if this is the case, we call it a perfect reliable ensemble systems. And um, ensemble systems tend to be under dispersive. Uh, it has gotten a lot better, but they're still under dispersive near the surface. And so this is why we use stochastic parameterization schemes in numerical weather prediction, because what they do is, is they widen this ensemble spread. You have a reliable ensemble system. If, and if you then compute the skill, you have a more skillful ensemble prediction system. And so this really addresses the random component of model error. Uh, 
so what you're really doing is in this in this context is you're increasing the variability by adding stochastic commoditizations. So this is sort of the first thing what we would expect if you include random numbers. Um, this slide is a comment um, uh, uh, by, um, sort of in uh, response to the debate last uh, yesterday afternoon between Antje and uh, and Magdalena. And it also pertains to um, Anish's introduction of uh, the Lorentz system and sensitivity to initial perturbations. So while there are many different stochastic parameterization schemes, and some of the discussion yesterday was about, should we perturb the parameters in the bulk parameterizations? Because we often know that those are not well constrained. Or should we um, add some sometimes called ad hoc parameterization schemes like uh, SPPT, the stochastic parameter perturbations that Anish talked about, or um, uh, there's uh, SCEPS, which is the kinetic energy backscatter scheme, which are sort of added on top to represent all the missing processes and all the lack of upscale error growth from the past. Um, or should we go with something more physically representative? And, um, and the point I'm trying to make here, I think that these ad hoc schemes work so well and that stochastic parameterization schemes work at all, is that where the error grows is really determined by the system and not by the particular stochastic parameterization scheme. So um, uh, I'm showing here forecasts over conus. I think this is brightness temperature and I'm showing, uh, this is done with WARF, uh, a weather model developed here. These are different lead times, it's 36 to 48 hours. So this is short time weather prediction, not S2S. And uh, uh, on the top um, is the impact of having stochastic uh, uh, parameter perturbations to the microphysics scheme. And on the bottom, we're perturbing um, the soil state over one particular grid box in Washington state. So this is the Northwest uh, here in this map. And what we see is that the amplitude and, and what we see is the difference um, uh, between two ensemble members with those um, perturbations. And so what we're seeing is that the pattern where those um, two trajectories um, spread is really very similar. There might be some differences in the amplitude, but we see for this particular case, it's a particular summer initialization. After 48 hours, you, you, your, your difference in these two trajectories is really that whether or not you have convection over the southeast of the United States. And it really didn't matter how exactly we were perturbing the system because the error would grow in the con convectively unstable regions. And so I think this is the true reason why sometimes the details of the stochastic parameterizations don't matter because it's the flow who organizes the error growth. However, if you look more uh, carefully, we do see there's some differences, especially in amplitude, but we, we did not objectively identify uh, the initial perturbations to be within a certain realm. It, it just was reasonable. And so this are, so th to the extent that those are different, different will different stochastic parameterization schemes or different model error schemes introduce different error growth. I also wanted to say um, there is skill from the mean. And so here on the left side, I'm showing a hypothetical forecast distribution for a particular lead time, doesn't matter. And then the climatological distribution. And so the difference, and so these have the same spread or the same variance uh, and be thinking of this as an ensemble. And so on the left side, on the right, right side is the climatological distribution. And so if we look at this difference, um, uh, that gives us the forecast skill. So the predictive skill comes from the difference of the ensemble mean forecast to the climatological mean. However, there's a, a different source of forecast skill and it comes from the spread. So um, even if the mean and the climatological mean are the same and they have different spread, there is skill in this forecast. So if you think that you have a forecast and it's five degrees C over Germany, and your climatological distribution is plus minus 10 C, then you're not sure if the precipitation on the roads will freeze and you have ice and accidents. 
um, uh, or not. However, if you, you can trust your forecast and your forecast says, yeah, it's going to be five degrees C, but the, the forecast uh, spread is only two degrees, then you can exclude that the roads, that the water on the roads will freeze and you have ice. And that is a very, very societally relevant forecast. So the skill can come from the ensemble mean, but there can also be skill in the spread. So um, I was now talking a little bit about the shorter time scales here, these ones, and now I want to move sort of to systematic model errors on the long time scale. So we know that um, if you have stochastic parameterizations, and here stochastic parameterizations are really a way of representing unrepresented small scale fluctuation processes. So these S2S models are typically run at horizontal resolutions of one degree. I'm talking about things that are smaller than one degree, mesoscale systems, high impact weather, small scale um, true atmospheric variability that is not represented. And so if you have this, you can really change the distribution of a system. So on the left side, we have a potential well. And so um, if you don't have noise there, it might sort of get stuck in that left um, minimum. And then as you add noise, the system will have a higher variance and it can reach um, face space um, states that it couldn't reach before. And if you then look at the bottom, you see that, the, that not only the variance of these distributions are changed, but also the mean. And so stochastic parameterizations or neglecting um, varying subgrid scale scales can um, uh, lead to an uh, increase in the ensemble spread, but they also have the potential to reduce systematic model errors. And the second one is very important on climatic time scales, uh, but I also want to make the case that also on the S2S time scale. And this is really something um, uh, that has not been fully explored. So, um, Joe made this comment that fluctuation small scales can lead to a um, stabilization of the system. And I thought I'd give you an example to this. This is an example for El Nino, but it's a way to understand noise induced drift. So here we are, uh, sh I'm showing um, the Nino 3.4 uh, index, the spectrum of it. Um, so we have frequencies against uh, power and on the left side for an, uh, control, um, control um, climate simulation here with CSM, it's an older version. And on the right side, uh, it's exactly the same simulation, but we added a stochastic parameterization. And what you can see is that it was damping these erroneously, uh, this erroneous um, peak uh, in the El Nino band. We then went to a very simple model. This is the model of a two-dimensional damped harmonic oscillator forced by additive noise, which is given here on the right side. So it only has two parameters. It has here a damping term, and then it has uh, a frequency. And this is just sort of a realization to picture what's going on. We then asked, there's two things you can do. You can perturb the frequency of this oscillator. So this is the equivalent of having a pendulum and then randomly changing the string. Or you can uh, change the damping of this and it needs to be state dependent. So we could imagine that the viscosity of the environment is different in the left and the right area where the pendulum swings through. Maybe it swings into water or honey or it could just be warmer air. And so uh, what you then can do is you can analytically show, and I'm not showing this here, that perturbing the frequency results in a decreased memory, which uh, is equivalent to a widening of the spectrum and no change in variance, whereas perturbing the damping right results in an increased memory, which is um, uh, equivalent to narrowing the spectrum and an increased variance. And so on the right side now, we can see we can, think, we can think of this as the unperturbed system, the uncontrolled simulation in Nino 3.4, and uh, that the stochastic um, parameterizations were acting as if they were uh, perturbing the frequency of this oscillator, and that led to the reduction or the dampening uh, stabilization of the system, um, leading to a uh, spectrum that's wider and not as peaked. 
And if we think of this really in physical terms, that, that makes sense. We're having these stochastic perturbations um, to, to the wind and to convection. And so what they really do is they decouple the atmospheric from the oceanic system. Um, and uh, a randomization of the frequency space and that acts as a damping. And you can show this analytically. So this is just an example how unresolved small uh, scale atmospheric processes can impact systematic model errors. And it is one example, um, the stochastic community would say, we have a noise induced drift, which acts as a damping and stabilizes the system. Um, interesting stuff goes on if we have representation of, um, uh, uh, if we have stochastic parameterizations in climate models, and very often the effect is similar as increasing resolution. And here is just an example, uh, it's already 10 years old, but uh, you can see that stochastic parameterization very often improve regime behavior and in particular blocking. And this is often linked to a bias in the Z500 uh, field, which tends to be, um, so the zone, the flow tends to be too zonal. And as soon as the stochastic um, parameterization break up that zonality of the flow, the system is really able to model um, blocking better. And uh, especially for blocking, um, the effects are often very similar to increasing resolution. So, um, so now I uh, talked about uh, the longer time scales and systematic model error, model error and now um, the S2S time scale here in the middle. I want to make the point it really is affected by both random and systematic model errors. And the comment I wanted to make is uh, Yaga showed us skill scores of CSM and she didn't compare directly to ECMWF, but on the subseason as to as time scale, the skill of CSM2 is really uh, similar to ECMWF um, for at least for two meter temperature. And I personally think that the reason for this is that ECMWF um, uh, is absolutely leading when it comes to short uh, for, to medium range forecasts because they have fantastic initializations. Um, but on the S2S time scale, the value of the initialization, especially the atmospheric initialization, uh, is starting to get forgotten. And what plays more of a role is the systematic model errors. And if you come from a climate model, you making sure that your biases are as small as possible, that your kind of teleconnection patterns are right, and that um, uh, your, your variance is correct. And I think this is why we get we capture these modes of variability uh, well in a climate model. And so although the initialization is not as perfect, uh, some of those um, reduced systematic errors um, are uh, really contributing to the S2S skill. Um, however, there is still lots of model error. Um, it can be shown then that biases from fast physics often develop in the first days to weeks. So the many climate biases really um, can be analyzed on very short um, time scales. Um, and one, one evidence for this is that S2S verification is still done on anomalies, not full fields. If we would do uh, S2S verification on full fields, the skill would be a lot less and probably negative um, in, uh, as in comparison to anomalies. And this is one of the projects in the verification tutorial is to look at uh, how much uh, do we gain by removing the lead time dependent bias in our models as opposed to just go with the fields, uh, the full fields. And so a uh, point I wanna make is that while it's really important to issue S2S forecasts for society and for doing research, I think it also is a real opportunity to improve our models because we can verify uh, weather processes on timescales where there's a lot of data. And, in, and as much as errors in the representation of those processes lead to climate biases, uh, we can really improve our models even on climatic timescales by looking at this timescale. Uh, some thoughts on predictability. Oh, 10, 11, 06, so I have. 10 minutes or 10 so. Minutes. Thanks, yeah. Um, so this plot was 
was made not in the context of S2S predictability, but multi-annual predictability by Brandstetter and Tang. And it shows really sort of this predictability from the first and the second kind. So the red um, distribution is the climatological distribution under global warming. And so you can see it just, uh, let's think of it as temperature, it just becomes warmer. And then this plume is showing the initial value of predictability. You initialize a system uh, with lead time shown on the x-axis, the, um, the spread gets bigger, but uh, as long as the, um, the spread is smaller um, than that of the uh, climatology, you have skill from initial uh, conditions. And this will obviously depend on your system um, here, they really have the ocean system in mind. It's done for the ocean system, uh, but conceptually the same is the case uh, for S2S and the atmosphere. This is also done in this context of uh, multi-annual predictability, but what you can see here, these blue lines are showing the predictability from uh, initial uh, conditions. And so they get lost uh, with the years, whereas the, um, uh, the green line shows the predictability of the second kind, the one coming from initial conditions. And this is purely through the knowledge, if it gets warmer, I can actually predict this really well. And so you get predictability of the second kind, namely through knowledge of the boundary conditions. And uh, they then made a quantification of the skill. This is here, this, uh, this blue, uh, excuse me, this black line, where uh, you sort of lose predictability, you have sort of a minimum, and then you gain predictability from the second kind. And uh, please correct me here. Um, I think this plot has not been quantified in this form for the S2S timescale. Um, and uh, I think uh, it would be different depending on, uh, on which regime the atmosphere is in. And it would be also different in what you, how you define your system. But I think it would be very interesting um, to produce um, plots like this on the S2S timescale. Um, and I should say what they use here as measure on the left side is relative entropy. And so this is a measure that combines information from the ensemble mean and the ensemble variance. Uh, plus higher order moments. So this is already a metric that uh, is not only looking at the mean, but the whole distribution. I end up with some thoughts on physical sources of predictability. What I did here is um, I tried to color code the sources of S2S predictability. And I have to be very clear for this troposphere. And I just color labeled predictability of the second kind and of the first kind. And obviously as we change a system, if we change it to the um, earth system, for example, then predictability of ENSO would be one from initial conditions. But for now on the S2S time scale, I choose that particular system, the troposphere, because then the strategy already um, is the predictability of the second kind, because you can think of the stratosphere forcing the atmosphere, although as Yaga and Amy said, it is much more complex. Um, and uh, yesterday we heard about regimes, and I thought I wanted to share some uh, thoughts about uh, regimes. I think for the atmosphere, they are clearly a predictability of the first kind. And uh, uh, Laura has shown us this plot on the left side, where they looked at forecasts where the initial state uh, projected on, let's say, the NAO minus state. And they compared that to um, uh, the average forecast, and they got uh, extended predictability by two to three days um, for states that predict on certain large scale states. And then Yaga has shown uh, uh, some skill with the CSM in predicting bi weekly NAO. So there is clearly intermittent skill. Uh, uh, for prediction on the S2S time scale. And this is why we have this workshop and that's why we lost to Joe on Monday. Um, so uh, the non so regimes have been studied uh, for many, many years and, and Laura gave us a very nice overview of this. Um, but typically they have been studied in the context of climate forecasts and dynamical systems. And so here's some work that I did for my PhD and it uh, was uh, analyzing a very long, um, simulation um, from a, a, a GCM. 
And uh, because we could run it out for so long, uh, we could look at the phase space tendency. So this is now uh, the phase space spanned by the uh, first and the fourth um, PC. And we saw that the system really very much um, uh, had, I'm not trying to say butterfly because I'm not trying to say initial conditions, but it has two special states. Uh, and one is characterized by a zonal state and one by a blocked state. Uh, and this particular model is combining the PNA and the NAO because it's a first generation model. And so what the atmosphere was doing, it was really circling around these states um, uh, if you removed the effect that if you ask where I'm going to be in 10 days, it'll be always closer to the climatological mean. But if we look at instantaneous tendencies, we saw that. And so what Laura's work then really did, at least for me in the first time, is to go from this climatological perspective to, um, um, to an initialized perspective. And just to mimic this here, um, I'm looking at daily data from the CSM, and I, um, I just uh, looked at the states that um, project under the NAO um, at time T0. These are the plus NAO, those are um, shown in red, and the minus NAO are shown in blue. And then I was following these cluster means um, over days, over the, uh, over the subseasonal time scale. And as you can see, they mix more and more. But then if you uh, look at the cluster mean and the location of the cluster mean, you see this interesting pattern. And so you see that on average, um, if you ask where am I uh, one day later, two days later, three days later, these uh, cloud of, uh, of uh, initial states, you will collapse to the climatological mean, which is here the zero, zero point. However, this, this, this uh, climatological forecast is, it's not just persistent, it not just gets closer and closer, but it swirls here around in some rather interesting fashion. And this is this regime predictability that Laura also showed in her phase space spaces based on the ESMWF forecasts. So where when you're here. Five minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm done. So, um, so, uh, so if you then look at one dimensional uh, projections, you see this emerging of the signal on the S2S timescale. And this is related to regime predictability and the fact that for these certain large scale patterns, the atmosphere is evolving on a low dimensional manifold as opposed to as chaotic as uh, in general. Uh, that's my summary. I think on the S2S time scale, both systematic and model, uh, uh, systematic and sorry, random model error play a role. I uh, talked a little bit about uh, predictability of the first and second kind, and it's not fully quantified uh, in the S2S time scale. Um, and that uh, regimes, which is a uh, example for predictability of the first kind, can be detected in climatological and initialized data. Um, and uh, predictability related to regimes fall on the predictability of the first kind and is captured by state of the art NWP models. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. It was, it was great. Um, yeah, a lot to digest and think about. So, students, any questions? Mm -hmm.